This video was sponsored by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Hello, mothers and marauders. My name is TP Skyen, and whenever I make videos criticizing the character designs of various characters, especially League of Legends champions, a few people in the comments will ask why I don't just make an improved version myself, putting some of the ideas I frame for improvements to the character design into practice. Sometimes that question comes from a completely good faith suggestion of a type of content that this person would like to see, and I really appreciate those. It's always nice when people engage with the thing that you put out enough to want to ask for more, whether or not they agree with the thing that you're saying. Sometimes, though, the question comes in the form of a dismissal. Specifically, well, if you can't do it better, then you can't criticize. Which is a particularly perfidious type of anti-intellectualism that gets on my tits sometimes, because it makes criticism of large corporations essentially impossible. If you can't criticize an MCU movie unless you yourself can make a better movie, then criticism is only available to people who have a hundred and fifty million dollars lying around with which to make a better film. The other way in which that kind of argument is perfidious is that it reduces all criticism down to a dick measuring competition where the critic's job is to defeat the art that they're trying to criticize in gladiatorial combat, to destroy it with facts and logic. And criticism simply isn't about that. Criticism isn't a fight with a winner and a loser, and the point of critique isn't to tear down and destroy whatever it is you're criticizing. Criticism is a tool for thinking. It's a means towards understanding. It is looking at something and figuring out how you feel about it. It's putting those feelings into words and constructing those words into arguments and opinions. It's a tool to build a path from I like or don't like this thing to I like or don't like this thing because. Anyway, one of the reasons I've been hesitant to make my own versions of League Champions is that I don't want people to see it as this gladiatorial challenge or an attempt to own Riot's artists by outdoing them. For one thing, I can't outdo them. Riot employs some of the most technically proficient game artists on the planet. For another, I'm not looking for a fight. I don't want to destroy their work. I don't want to take them down a peg. I don't want to prove that I'm better than them because that's not the point of any of what I do. I want to think about character design, about stories, about world building, about themes and ideas and visual art. I want to share those thoughts and hopefully entertain some of you guys in the process. And if I'm really f***ing lucky, hey, maybe something I say inspires someone someday, whether because they agree with it or because they think I'm completely wrong. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Skyen, that's all well and good, but you did title the video Building a Better Ash, and I don't know, that sounds a bit like you're trying to win a fight. And, uh, well, I, I, yeah. The trouble is that YouTube videos kind of need to have snappy titles so that sh the people want to click on them, but also so that they understand kind of what the video is about before they decide to watch it. And also, building a better ass just fits a lot better within the character limit for YouTube titles than building a subjective but hopefully well-reasoned argument for a different character design for Ash in the hopes of inspiring critical discourse. So instead of the video having that long, boring title, you get this long, boring preamble where I explain the concept of the video in detail. So we're all hopefully on the same page before we move on to the actual intro of the video, which looks like this. In the long, boring preamble, I mentioned one of the reasons I haven't been making my own character designs is a fear that people will misunderstand it as a challenge rather than taking it as a part of an argument. The other reason is that making good art takes a heck of a long time, and time, unfortunately, is at a bit of a premium for me these days. I actually had to put a different series on my channel on hold in order to be able to even make this video, and I've got a bunch of other projects that I'm working on, so spending an extra at least six or seven hours doing design iteration and thumbnailing and silhouette design and all the other things that go into creating like a full character design for a single video just wasn't really an option for me, at least not with the way that I'm producing videos right now to keep the wheels turning and paying my rent and stuff. Fortunately, there is a secret technique passed down the generations that allows a person to cause art to happen even if they don't have the time or skills to make it happen themselves, and it is called getting someone else to do it for you. 
to that end, meet Applecork. He's an artist I have commissioned to help me with this particular project, and all of the artwork of our designs that you're going to be seeing is produced by him with input, criticism, and feedback from me. Now, a little elephant in the room is that we are not the first people to be doing this kind of thing. A YouTube channel called Subjectively already has a running series of videos where they redesign existing League of Legends champions into something that they feel is better. So I just wanted to shout them out and say go follow them if you enjoy this kind of content. They have some excellent videos and redesigns of their own. And I will be making an effort to make this video substantively different from what it is that Subjectively is doing. Although again, criticism is not about having a big slap fight over who is better at doing the thing. It's about having a critical discourse about a subject. Take our video and Subjectively's videos not as opposing hot takes, but as different parts of that same discussion. Anyway, before we get into how we want to change Ash the Frost Archer, maybe we should first have a little refresher on... Say hello to Ash the Frost Archer from League of Legends. But, oh, oh, you don't recognize her. Well, that's understandable. Uh, what if we do this? A little bit closer now, isn't it? This is the Dark Ranger from Warcraft 3. Specifically, she is Sylvana's Windrunner from the expansion to Warcraft 3, Frozen Throne. Now, Warcraft 3 had a rather popular mod for it, an alternate game mode called Defense of the Ancients. You may have heard of it. Nowadays, we refer to it as Dota. Now, Dota was a very popular game mode, but it had one big problem, which is that Blizzard owned all of it, all of its assets, all of its everything, which meant that nobody who was running Dota game modes, nobody who was developing for it had any real right to be making money from it. It was a big legal problem area that nobody really wanted to touch with a 10-foot pole, least of all Blizzard. Still, there was a huge demand for this kind of gameplay, which of course creates a business opportunity. So, developers of the original Dota mod went a few different directions trying to capitalize on this particular trend, and we get a rush of Dota clones coming to market. Among these, our League of Legends, developed in part by one of the original developers of Dota. And League of Legends, especially in its early days, was... It was a clone, like, it, it had its own differences and its own little twists and turns, but it really did not do very much at all to differentiate itself that substantially from Defense of the Ancients. The whole point was to take the gameplay of Defense of the Ancients and port it over to an IP that you could monetize free of Blizzard's influence. And who should turn up? in the original version of League of Legends, but Ash the Frost Archer, a character who inherits the skill set of the Priestess of the Moon character from Warcraft 3, grafted on to the character design of the Dark Ranger. Now, from the very beginning, Ash was from the Freljord, and she was one of the three sisters of the Freljord and a direct descendant of Avarosa, same as we know her today. But the concept of the story is that she lives and works at the Institute of War, which holds the League of Legends tournament, in which she is fighting as a means to gather political power to secure her position back home in the Freljord, which is the central conceit of the original League of Legends narrative. Why are all these weird cartoon characters fighting each other in a big battle arena? Well, it's they come from all over the world and also other dimensions and also from space, and they're all here because there's a big fighting tournament, which something something politics of the world, rune wars, blah blah blah, it's not really important. It's just a quick justification for bringing these characters together so we can play some goddamn Dota. It's about the same premise, essentially, as Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter. And that was very much the character design sensibility of League of Legends in those days. There wasn't really a lot of concern about coherent world building or character designs making particular sense in the context of the environments that those characters were supposed to be from. They were supposed to be fighting game characters. Big, over-the-top, cartoony, larger-than-life caricatures of various archetypes that would be fun to slap against each other in a big, cheesy online fantasy game. Hence, Ash, the Frost Archer, who comes from the cold, frozen, frigid plains of the north, walking around in thigh-high boots and miniskirt, her cleavage out, and a tiny little thin silk sheet of a cloak to keep her warm. She wasn't really meant to do world-building for the Freljord, she was just supposed to look interesting and eye-catching for the players. And in that, I think it's fair to say that she succeeded. So those are the origins of Ash, and these are the reasons why she looks the way she does. The world building for the Freljord and the concern for world building came along much later. The Viking-inspired aesthetics, the concept of the frost-resistant iceborne, the concept of true ice, which has become so important to mythology today, all of that got added 
way after Ash's character design was solidified in League of Legends and long after her 2012 visual and gameplay update, which mostly aimed to bring her up to a modern graphical fidelity for 2012 League of Legends, not so much to bring her into agreement with the still very much in development lore and world building of her region. Now though, it is nine years later, and things have changed. In the modern state of the lore, Ash is the war mother of Avarosa, a radical Freljord tribe that rejects the bloodstained might makes right warrior culture that has dominated the region for generations in favor of cooperation, compassion, and mutual aid. Ash saw the obsession with destiny and warrior brutality ruin not only her own tribe and the life of her mother, but one of her most trusted and beloved friendships with Sejuani, who would go on to become the brutal leader of the Winter's Claw. In the Freljord, the Iceborn rule by strength, and the Hearthbound, that is, people who aren't Iceborn, are largely treated as disposable and die of cold and starvation when the brutal raiding of the Iceborn either victimizes them or fails to bring home enough food to keep them alive through the winter. Ash rescues a small group of Hearthbound from the brutality of the Winter's Claw and sets out across a frozen sea with them to do the impossible, to survive and thrive and build a better world in the Freljord, like the heroes of old. This is why, ultimately, she claims the name of Avarosa. She calls on that ancient heroic legacy to strengthen her claim to authority in the face of opposition from both Sejuani's Winter's Claw, but especially from Lissandra and the Frost Guard, who have been running centuries of censorship and repression on the myths and legends of the Three Sisters. Lissandra alone claims to be the destined spiritual leader of the Freljord, a position that she uses for her own dark purposes, and Ash's claim to Avarosa's legacy is a means to counter that power. But Ash is not Avarosa. She found the bow in an unmarked grave on top of a glacier and was thrust into the role of War Mother not by destiny, but by her own decisions to stand by her principles. And that role of leadership wears on her. It is a constant struggle to keep her own legend alive while keeping the long histories of violence in the Freljord from breaking out within her own cosmopolitan tribe. She holds her people together with both hands and a prayer, desperate to find a way to be better than her mother was and better than Sejuani turned out. So there are perfectly sensible reasons why Ash looks the way she does. It's easy to explain how we ended up with the character design that we have, but because the game has moved on around her and she has not changed with the times, that leads to a lot of... If you're familiar with my channel and you follow me for any length of time, you probably have a pretty decent idea of what's coming up in this section, but the major TLDR is that Ash's character design simply doesn't match the story that it's meant to tell. And the most obvious problem is that she isn't dressed for the Freljord. And by this, I don't just mean that she's showing skin. That's not really the problem. The problem is that the clothes she is wearing simply don't look like they are from the place where she lives. Freljord fashion is broadly defined by furs, heavy leather, and angular metal. Each tribe has its own style. The Winter's Claw tends to be identified by browns and darker natural colors and lots of leather. The Frost Guard like to wear extremely dark blues and blacks and lots of metal. And the Avarosans deck themselves out in bright sapphire blue and white fabrics, typically with a lot of white fur trim. Ash looks like none of these. She wears black with gold trims, no furs or leathers whatsoever, and she's generally dressed for a much warmer environment than the bleak tundras of the Freljord. Now, even if Ash was just a character who likes to dress skimpy for, well, whatever reason, her outfit still isn't made of the materials or derived from the fashion or the color aesthetics of her home region. She doesn't look like she's from the Freljord. And this actually creates a double problem, because Ash not only doesn't look like she's from the Freljord, she doesn't look like she is from the tribe that she's supposed to be the leader of. Ash is the war mother of Avarosa, and her people believe her to be the reincarnation of Avarosa herself. She's revered with a religious awe, and the Avarosans look to her for leadership and guidance. She is the exemplar from which the tribe draws its identity, but... That's not what it looks like when her colors and her materials and her entire fashion sense is completely alien to the tribe that she leads. Riot, to their credit, know this, and in more recent artwork and versions of the character like her Wild Rift or Legends of Runeterra incarnations, they've changed her design to try and incorporate the colors and materials of her region. 
Another way that Ash doesn't look like she lives in the Freljord is that her design lacks any of the visual signifiers of a life spent in struggle and rough conditions. Her body and presentation is designed first and foremost to be conventionally beautiful. Hence, she's skinny, slender, hourglass-shaped, and busty. Hence, her fashion decisions are cleavage, miniskirts, and thigh highs. And there's nothing wrong with being any of those things or dressing that way, but the visual storytelling that's associated with looking like that isn't really war leader on the unforgiving tundra. It's fashion model, or celebrity, or influencer, none of which Ash is meant to be. And on a broader, more thematic level, Ash also doesn't really work as part of the Freljord leader trifecta. She doesn't really work as a contrasting character design to Lysandra or Sejuani. Lysandra is this brilliantly intimidating, towering ice witch, fully clad in black with her face obscured by a mask, which, damn, oh yeah, that's, that's what the Frost Guard is all about, right? Darkness, intimidation, and secrets. And Sejuani is this heavily armored battle tank charging into battle on a giant snowboard, which, hell yeah, that has Winter's Claw energy for days. That is their way of life. But then you look at Ash, and it's like... Mm. The whole point of her tribe is this radical rejection of might makes right warrior culture. She's supposed to embody a philosophy of kindness, compassion, and cooperation as a contrast to the brutality of the Winter's Claw and the selfish hoarding of the Frost Guard. And where is that in her design? Now, I admit she does contrast strongly with Lysandra and Sichuani in that Ash looks nothing like she belongs in the Freljord, and they do, but she doesn't contrast with them in a way that helps, you know, the world building last problem we're going to talk about is her sexualization. And for this topic, quick digression, when you talk about sexualization being good or bad for a character design and you criticize it, people have a tendency to misinterpret that as like a blanket condemnation of all sexuality everywhere in media, which... <sighs> but just to be clear, sexualization in a character design isn't inherently good or inherently bad. It is a tool, a tool which a designer can use well or poorly while crafting a character. And what I'm going to argue with Ash is that sexualization is the wrong tool for this particular design job. The reason why is pretty simple. Ash is not a sexual character. Her story, her themes, her personality, her conflicts, her goals, these things don't really tie into sexuality. Unlike characters like say, Cassiopeia, Elise, or Evelyn, whose stories are in various ways about their looks and the ways they use their sexuality to get what they want, nothing about Ash brings her sexuality into play at all. In fact, she actively rejects romantic and physical intimacy. In the lore, she was being pressured politically into taking husbands from the various tribes under her command and was looking for a way to get out of it when she saw, like, this angry murder hobo called Trindamir fighting everyone out in the dueling ring and she was like, hmm, he has no tribe, he has no political interests. That's great. Hey, dude, could you please marry me and be my beard so I can get all these goddamn suitors off my back? Now, eventually, a genuine affection has apparently bloomed between Ash and Trindamir, but that's not why they got together. They got together specifically so that Ash could avoid the sexual politics of the Freljord and just focus on doing her damn job. Now, as we know, Ash was originally designed on some level to be eye candy for the early League of Legends game, but in her modern situation, the result of that is that there's a lot of space in her character design just taken up with making her hot. Thigh highs, miniskirt, hourglass shape, cleavage, and bust, all of these are parts of her physical design that could be put to work doing other things for her character, but which are currently, in my opinion, being wasted on trying to make her sexy, even though that doesn't really add anything useful or meaningful to her character or her story. And again, in case anyone is determined to misunderstand me in the comments, none of this means that a character can't be sexy and be a strong leader or a warrior. None of this means that being sexy is somehow degrading or evil, and absolutely none of what I have said means that anyone is wrong or stupid for liking or preferring Ash's character design the way it is. I am making a subjective argument that sexualization is detrimental to this character in this context. So, let's summarize all of this with a list. Number one, Ash doesn't look like she's from the Freljord. Number two, Ash doesn't look like a good representative of the Avarosan tribe. Number three, Ash doesn't look like a warrior who has lived in the Freljord fighting all her life. And number four, her design wastes too many resources on making her look hot for no reason. 
Whenever I discuss the problems with Ash's character design, people like to say, well, what about Trindomir, Braum, Gragas, and Olaf? They all run around without nearly enough clothes. Why aren't you talking about them? And in this case, the reason is that this video isn't about them, it's about Ash, but in anticipation of the comments happening anyway, here's a quick answer. Gragas, Olaf, and Trindomir are not from the Freljord, or rather they are, but they weren't supposed to be. All three of them originally came from different places. Trindomir from something called the Fyrone Flats, Gragas from the foothills around the Great Barrier Mountains, and Olaf from a tribe of raiders who lived in a place called Lokfar. They were merged into the Freljord as part of Riot's effort to tidy up their world building, but they were not designed for it. So yes, I think it's also a problem that Trindomir runs around with no shirt on, Olaf's character at least wears some leather and some fur but also looks terrible, and I don't even know where to begin with all the things that are bad about Gragas' character, but running around in a loincloth on a glacier certainly doesn't help. Braum, however, is a different story and in an interesting way. As you'll see in media like the Ash Warm or the comic, Iceborne don't run around in snowstorms with their shirts off because even though they are resistant to freezing, extreme cold still hurts. Now, Braum's key trait as a champion is his legendary strength and resilience. He's essentially a kind of living folk hero who has made it his life's mission to inspire others, and one of the things he does to build his legend is do stuff that other Iceborne can't, like for example, run around in a snowstorm with no shirt on. He does this specifically to show off and be impressive, it is part of what makes him remarkable, even among other Iceborne. So yes, Trindomir, Olaf, and Gragas also running around without sensible clothing is a double problem. Not only does it make their own designs contradict the world building of the Freljord, they make Braum seem less special by diminishing the power that makes him unique. So in case anyone wanted to ask, yes, it is also dumb that the other Freljord characters aren't dressed for the weather, hashtag shirts for the Freljord. There is no such thing as a perfect character design. Art is a creative discipline. It is grounded in subjectivity and deeply dependent on cultural and historical context for its function. For example, you know how classic superhero designs often had underpants on the outside of their suits? That's a design trope which they lifted from old-timey acrobats and wrestlers who would often wear extra undergarments on top of their spandex to prevent an indecent wardrobe malfunction if their spandex were to rupture. In its time, the underwear on the outside of spandex thing was a visual signifier that said this person is a strong man or an acrobat or otherwise physically powerful, and superhero artists used that trope to design their own characters to look powerful by association. Fast forward 80 years, and nowadays underpants on the outside of the suit is a visual signifier for superheroes, and character designers use that to design characters for that purpose. Although, admittedly, the trope is at this point more common in superhero parodies than actual heroes. Which is one of the reasons why there is no such thing as a perfect character design, because meaning is fluid, and different visual tropes and cues mean different things to different people in different cultures at different times. So. Instead of chasing perfect solutions, you make trade-offs, you iterate, you prioritize, you pick aspects of a character to emphasize, parts of their story that you particularly want to tell, and you shape your design accordingly. Which is what you're looking at right now. This is a series of ideations where we're exploring a variety of different silhouettes, shapes, and general concepts for what this character could possibly look like. We're testing out different levels of muscularity, different body types, different configurations for her cloak shape and her general outfit design, as well as different levels of femininity. Personally, I quickly take a liking to this row here for a couple of reasons, but initially because it retains a lot of her femininity, which I think is important to the character, but also has a shape and body type that quite literally no other champion in the game has. Applecork, for his part, got interested in these two rows and began iterating on a version combining some of those designs, emphasizing Ash as a warrior character. Having each of us started to hone in on the broad shapes that we're looking for, we move on to faces. Now, again, if you've followed my channel for a while, you'll know that one of my critiques of League of Legends is that its women tend to have very similar faces, conforming usually pretty blandly to very basic beauty ideals. So here, we're trying to find something that will make Ash a more distinctive and recognizable character. Fortunately, because League women tend to fall into such a narrow range by default, we really don't have to do that much to make our versions distinct. Frankly, any of these options would accomplish that particular goal. I end up leaning towards some of the rounder versions of her face, while Applecork goes for something a bit stronger jawed and a little bit more butch. Moving on. 
in the refinement process, we begin exploring different costume ideas, mixing, matching from the earlier stage of the process, and you can see both of us start to zero in on the design direction we want to take our versions of the character. And so, with a lot of back and forth and iteration and detailing behind us, each of us settle on our final design concepts for building a better Ash. And we'll start with Applecork, who chose to zero in somewhat on the warrior aspect of Ash. Now, he has written up a short piece about his design decisions, which he has asked me to read for you now. In the original pitch of this project, I suggested three final looks for Ash. As the project progressed, Skyn and I agreed to do two final looks. In addition to his own Ash, Skyn thought that I should lead the second final look so that we could present our own ideas. I thought that was a really neat idea, and so here we go. The very first two things I had on my mind were practicality and homage. I definitely wanted to make a few logical changes to Ash's character design both in her clothing and her physical body. However, at the same time, I wanted to do my best to keep as much of the original character as I possibly could. I wanted to approach this variant of Ash with a level of conservatism. I thought, since Skyen was really leaning in such a new and fresh direction, I could act as a medium keeping Ash within the, air quotes, conventional definition of what is attractive to show that she can still be attractive without exposed skin all over her body. So, what changed with Ash's physical appearance? Well, first, her body type needed to change. During one of our first discussions, Skyn and I talked about body types and talked a lot about practicality. Skyn showed me a video of this amazing old Viking-looking dude who did archery throughout his life. Despite his age, this guy was jacked, especially his back, since those were the muscles he used to draw back the bowstring. I beefed up Ash generally all around and focusing particularly on her upper body. Although it isn't easy to see underneath all her clothing and armor in the front shot, I hope the back shot will give you a better idea of what I was going for. As for her face, I wanted to do something new. While looking through all of the different female League characters, I realized they all had flawless skin for some reason. All I did was three simple edits. First, I gave her facial scars. The scars have a story behind them and also helps instill a sense of respect among her peers in the warrior culture of the Freljord. Next, I gave her thicker, unkempt eyebrows. Who has time to think about plucking eyebrows when everyone's survival is the priority? Finally, I just squared off her jaw and chin, just to give her a slightly different face shape. If nothing else, I think these character changes make her fairly distinctive if you were to stick her in a lineup with the other female League characters. Now, onto her clothing. My first move was to cover up the exposed skin. Again, practicality. There isn't really any reason for a person who actively hunts and fights in a snowy region to run around in a bikini top and a mini skirt as her standard attire. At the same time though, also homage. I wanted to keep as many components as possible of the original Ash design and shape language. I also wanted to keep her outfit as form-fitting as possible while making sure that she was properly covered and looked warm. Exposing the inner fur lining of multiple pieces of her attire was a good way of communicating this. I kept the silver white wrapping around her waist. I felt that was a signature part of her original design, plus it helps complement her white hair. The only thing I changed was that I borrowed the golden pins found on the Wild Rift Ash design. 
Another thing I altered was the hood decoration. I felt that since she was a queen, I should incorporate a crown design into the hood decor. In some rough sketches I did, Skyn pointed out not to make the crown too prominent since it starts to look like the ruined king's silhouette. So I scaled back the crown points and incorporated the crown gem found in the Queen Ash design to give an aspect of royalty. I also copied Skyn's idea of hawk feathers. I absolutely loved the incorporation of an aspect of her spirit animal and bound a few feathers onto her cape clasp. Both Skyn and I liked the idea of including Ash's banner on her pauldron, her shoulder armor. Since I wanted to pay homage to the original Ash designs, I snuck her original pauldron design into different parts of our Ashes. Speaking of her chest guard, I want to briefly talk about color. Ash's base color palette is a cool purplish black with the golden white accents, but the updated Legends of Runeterra Ash bears a similar color palette switching out the black for a rich dark blue. However, I felt that brown was missing. I wanted to tie her more closely to the color palette of her Avarosan tribe, which offers a range of browns, blues, and golds. Ash is also the type of leader who works closely with her people, so it would make sense that she would wear clothing similar to them. Therefore, I had to find a bunch of places to stick leather onto her person, and her leather chest guard was an obvious choice. But I wanted to find one more major spot so that it didn't stand out too much, and I ended up going with her right glove. During some ideation phases, I drafted different color and design variants for Skyne's Ash, and among the color choices, I really fell in love with a simple brown glove with blue and gold lining. Luckily for me, Skyne ended up picking a different glove design, and so I happily copied that one over to mine. After that, I just stuck leather straps to places where it would make sense, like the underside of her vambrace, or a strap around her boot to hold that sort of half-sabaton in place, and some garter belt straps to hold her thigh-high boots. And that's about it. I hope you enjoyed listening to my thought process throughout the project. Back to you, Skyn. As for me, I chose a different focus for the character. I zeroed in on Ash as a representative of the values of the Avarosans. Ash as War Mother, specifically. Because, as I've harped on about, the Avarosans represent something radical in the Freljord, a principle of cooperation, mutual aid, and compassion in the face of scarcity, rather than the blood-soaked raiding culture that has dominated so far, where desperate people steal from desperate people, burning crops and decimating herds of cattle in the process. So, as the leader of the Avarosans, Ash represents, if not the reality, then at least the philosophical idea of plenty that through cooperation it is possible to provide enough for everyone, rather than fighting over scraps and leaving one another to starve and die. So making Ash plus-sized thus solves multiple of the design problems we were talking about. It helps her embody the values of Avarosa, and makes her a distinct and effective contrast with the other leaders. Lysandra is this sheer vertical ice wall of inscrutable mystery, practically a statue in motion. Sejuani is a hardened and hard-bitten warrior obsessed with physical strength and overwhelming power, but Ash is neither of those things. She is soft, she's curvy, and she is generous. She represents a way of life where softness is not just possible, but desirable. Where you don't have to fight and kill and bleed and die and suffer all the time, but you can actually, you know, live a life. She represents a way of being that rejects cold manipulation and brutal force. She's the war mother of Avarosa, and she's here to take care of all of her children. 
And here I am leaning on some problematic tropes, like the idea that fat people are inherently big, soft, cuddly, non-threatening teddy bears, ooh-woo, or that fat women somehow inherently represent fertility and maternal care, when, you know, women are a lot more than just mothers, regardless of their body size. And while I think in the context of the many other women who are in League of Legends, Ash being a mother figure wouldn't be, you know, reductive as such, it is still a valid line of criticism against this particular design. Another trade-off I make is that I sacrifice the warrior aspect of her character. There are some gestures towards it. The archer's chest guard and the shiny metal bracer on her firing hand are both there to give her some warlike attributes. But because I wanted to focus on constructing her as a contrast to Sejuani and as a representative of her tribe's philosophy, I ultimately decided against giving her battle damage or scars, and against making her look in any way aggressive. This is an intentional trade-off, but still, it's a valid line of criticism against my design because that aspect of her character is underrepresented in the final product. Another trade-off I made, and this is something Apple Cork and I discussed during the design process, is that in the lore, Ash is pretty stressed out overall. Like, holding the Avarosans together is hard. She struggles to feel worthy of the power she has. There's all these complicated tribal politics to manage, so one thing we were talking about was giving her, like, dark circles under her eyes, or maybe making her look a little hollowed out and tired. This is kind of an important part of her story, and when we started, it was something I really wanted to represent visually, but as we went along, ultimately, I decided that I wanted Ash to represent the Avarosan ideal just as much as Sejuani and Lysandra represent the ideals of their tribes, and making her look haggard and exhausted just felt like undercutting that ideal rather than supporting it. Again, this is a valid line of criticism against this design, but it is also an intentional trade-off. Anyway, to finish off, let me just gush over some of the fine detail we worked into this design. First of all, um, we decided to add feathers to her design, because Ash technically has this connection with hawks that's not really explored in her lore, as far as I know, but given that Sejuani has the animal association with the boar, I thought it would be a nice way to kind of mirror that idea in Ash. So we've got omen hawk feathers attached to her design here and there to emphasize that connection. And since I really wanted Ash to be Ash the Warm Mother, I really wanted her to be the chief of her tribe, like really represent the iconography of Avarosa. So we've got these triple banners on the front of her skirt, and we put the Avarosa arrow sigil on there, as well as on her pauldron and the hood of her cloak and we got she's got these little tokens and talismans and knickknacks hanging off her belt just little cultural artifacts like maybe they're amulets or gifts that her tribe have given her as tribute like little presents from the children like something something nice and wholesome and something i really liked um we lifted the ornamentation and decoration around the bottom of her skirt from the queen ash skin just to work a little bit of continuity in there i thought that was a nice little cross reference um i wanted my ash in general to look a little bit rich again to reflect the idea that the Avarosans represent plenty and some level of luxury rather than the squalor and constant like, oh, suffering makes you strong nonsense that dominates so much of the Freljord. Hence, embroidery, trinkets, and sort of the general sumptuousness of her design. And there you have it, a bid from me and Apple Cork on what Ash could, and in our opinion, should, look like. Now, to reiterate, there is no such thing as a perfect character design, and neither of our concepts are meant to be the perfect Ash. There are versions of her that we believe express her concept and lore better than what's in the game right now, but of course, if you prefer the old Ash, that's completely fine. Everyone has a right to their preference, and I'm not going to argue with that, but I hope you can at least see our perspectives and understand why we think we have built a better Ash. Thank you to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare, which helped me pay Apple Cork for his time and skills. And if you'd like to improve or learn some new skills of your own, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your own creativity. Skillshare is a learning platform, so it has no ads, and at an annual membership, the price works out to less than $10 a month. 
Personally, I've been enjoying Evan Abrams' series Introduction to Adobe After Effects, which is helping me get started learning that program and has demystified a lot of the functions for me, so it's a lot faster than trying to learn it on my own. But if this video has gotten you interested in trying some character design development of your own, Charlie Bowater has a series on character concept art that teaches you the same kinds of processes that we use to create the designs for this video. Thank you again to Skillshare for their support of this channel. Hey, thank you very much for watching. This video was sponsored, so I'm not going to do the self-promotion song and dance today. Instead, I'm going to promote someone else for a change. My friend Art Teapot is a tremendously talented Italian comic artist with a really fun and unique art style, and they run a League of Legends fan webcomic called Banshee. It is set in the Coven Skinline universe, and it imagines a story for Lulu if she existed in that skinline, where she's an apprentice witch at a coven of witches that is slowly being eaten alive by a monstrous traitor on the inside, and she's discovering her own witch powers with the help of a talking corpse, of all things. Visually, like, Mwah, just look at all those frickin' colors, man, and it is honestly so rare to see a good fan webcomic these days, so I've just been consuming this thing like fine food. Anyway, the pandemic has been rough for everyone, but it's been particularly rough for Art Teapot. Like, bills are getting hard to pay, and it is really hard to find work as an artist or get your artwork noticed on the internet these days. So, if you have a spare dollar lying around, and you want exclusive access to some of the fantastic illustrations that they post, and if you want to help out an artist who is genuinely following their passion, there's a link to their Patreon and to the webcomic Banshee down in the description. And as a side note, I've been doing okay recently, both on Patreon and with this sponsorship, so if you support me on Patreon, I would fully support it if you lower or cancel your pledge to me and transfer it to Art Teapot instead, because they need the support a lot more than I do right now. Of course, if you don't want to or you can't support it financially, that's completely fine, but do check out the webcomic and check in on it every once in a while, because it's really good, genuinely. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Let me and Apple Cork know in the comments how you like the designs that we came up with and whether or not you would like more videos in this general style. Besides that, please remember to wear a mask and wash your hands and take the vaccine when it comes and try to act in solidarity with those who are working to make the world a better place. Music